hey everyone, let's talk some more about this sigma notation. Because um, in, in the not too distant future, we're going to be expected to have to compute uh, and simplify some quantities that involve this sigma notation. So it's important we're familiar with some properties uh, available to us for this sigma notation. So the first one I want to mention here is that if you have some sum, some sum, right? If you have some sum of a sequence there, and there's a constant multiple in front of your sequence, you can actually factor it out in front of the sequence. And the justification of this is actually pretty simple, because if you have the sum of c times a i, well, what this means is you take c times a m plus c times a m plus one uh, plus c a m plus two, and you proceed all the way down to the last term c a n. And you'll notice that every term in this sum has a factor of c, right? C a, c a, c a, c a, just a bunch of c's and a's, right? The a's are all different based upon the sequence, but the c is constant throughout everything. And as a mathematician, when I see a constant factor, I cannot help myself, but I have to factor it out, as you can see illustrated right here. And so when you factor this out, you'll get c times, well, a m plus a m plus 1, and this will proceed all the way down to a n. And recognizing that this sum, the a m, the a m plus 1, this is just our original sigma, we get c times, uh, whoops, that looks poorly, c times sigma a i, like so. And so this idea of factoring a constant out of the sum is really just a distributive property uh, that is just factory. Uh, it really is just factoring right here. And so feel free to use that justification when you work with these type of calculations. Um, also, if you take the sum of a sum, that's equal to a sum of sums. Uh, that's, that's a nice little tongue twister. Um, it's also true if you take a sum of a difference, then it's a, it's a difference of sums. Uh, but let's see it for sums right here. Uh, the idea is if you take a sum, oh boy, try that again. If you take a sum of AI plus BI, if you write this in expanded form, you're going to get some AM plus BM. Uh, then you're going to get an AM plus 1 plus a BM plus 1. And then you keep on doing this until you get to the end of the, of the sum here. You'll end up with an AN plus a BN. And so this is a sum. So it's commutative. It's associative. We can move things around. We can ignore parentheses here. And what's case, if we try to gather all of the A's together, we gather all the A's. This is sort of like the proverbial sifting the, the wheat from the tares, right? So if we gather all the A's together, we're going to get an AM plus an AM plus 1 um, all the way down to AN. And then if we put all the B's together, we get BM plus BM plus 1. And this will continue all the way down to BN, like so. Well, this first group, all the A's together, that's none other than just the sum of all the A's. And if you add up all the B's together, that's just going to be the sum of all the B's, right? And that's and that kind of proves that, um, that property right there. It works very similar for differences, that if you uh, add all of those A minus B's together, you can add all the A's together, all the B's, and it'll, it'll add up to the original thing. Um, I want to point out that if you put these properties together, uh, this is something we talked about before. This is known as the linearity property. Uh, so we see this a lot in calculus, uh, that limits are linear. That is, uh, if you add limits or you scale limits, uh, these type of properties happen. You can factor the constants out. You can break a sum on the inside as a sum on the outside. Uh, derivatives have this linearity property. Indefinite integrals, aka antiderivatives, we've seen have, have that property. And sig the sigma sum uh, also has this linearity property. This thing shows up in calculus all the time. Uh, this is sort of like a peek towards a deeper subject of mathematics called linear algebra, uh, which you should take a look into it sometime if you're interested. Uh, it turns out there's a ton of linear algebra in calculus. Uh, so the other thing is I want to talk about is not just the linearity property, but what are some specific uh, formulas you can use for these sigmas here? So this is sort of like the sigma version of the power rule, uh, because when it came to derivatives, if we knew what to do to power functions, that is take the derivative, and we know how to add and scale them, then we're able to take the derivative of any polynomial or algebraic expression that kind of resembles a polynomial. And the previous lectures, 
as we talked about antiderivatives, we did a similar thing. We developed the linearity rule. Uh, we also were able to take antiderivatives of power functions. And this allows us to take the, the, the antiderivative of any polynomial. We did the same thing for limits. So we're kind of going through the circle over and over and over again that we develop uh, the linearity property for this calculus operation. We're talking about sigmas today. And so now if we can talk about powers, uh, then we're in a position where we can start uh, computing the sums in this situation, the sigma operation of polynomials. And that's kind of going to be our goal right now. So what do you do if you take a constant? So if you just add up together the number one, 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 you do that n times, that adds up to be n. And the idea is if you add up together one, uh, you end up with a one plus a one plus a one plus a one until the very end. And if you do this to a total of n times, well, then what's that going to be? One plus one plus one plus one, that's going to add up to the n. All right, that's not, that's not too crazy there, but it's important to know. That's how one deals with the sigma of a constant. Uh, what about the next one? Well, before we talk about the next one here, so the sigma, uh, well, you take the sum of one to n, you just take the sum of i here. So what this thing would look like, you're taking one plus two plus three plus four plus five, all the way up to the number n you're considering right here. Um, I wanna kinda mention before we explain the formula, uh, a fun little historical story that goes along with it. And so this one is often attributed to the very famous mathematician, Carl Frederick Gauss. Uh, and in fact, this legend goes to when he was just a boy, maybe like 10 years old. Uh, he was, Gauss is supposedly in his classroom and his teacher gave all of the students in the school uh, the, mission, the, the, the assignment where they had to add up together the numbers one plus two plus three plus four plus five, all the way up to a hundred, right? That's a lot of arithmetic there. And that certainly would keep a 10 year old busy uh, on his homework for a while, maybe so that the teacher could go take a break or something, run some photocopies, whatever. Clearly they didn't do photocopies. Uh, Gauss lived a couple hundred years ago, but, but nonetheless, how does, how does one compute this? Well, most of the students in the class, uh, went about in the sort of the obvious way. One plus one is, uh, sorry, one plus two is three, three plus three is six, six plus four is 10, 10 plus five is 15 plus six is 21. You just kind of do this over and over and over again. And you're going to get 100, uh, I should say 99 different sums you have to do along the way. And even when someone's really good at arithmetic, um, if you do this many time, uh, this many sums, I mean, it's really time consuming. And also you're bound to make a mistake eventually, right? And so no one was able to get the correct sum, um, except for little, uh, little Carl here, get Mr. Gauss. Uh, do you call a 10 year old Mr.? I don't know. But, but Gauss here, uh, he, he took a different strategy in mind. And so this kind of shows you sort of the, 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 the prodigy that he, that he was at the time. So if you take the sequence one up to a hundred, if you list it backwards, 100 plus 99 plus 98 plus 97 plus 96, and you proceed all the way down to one, um, Gauss made the following observation. If you put them in pairs, so he, he took, he took the sum one through a hundred, then he took it and wrote it backwards. And if you put these next to each other and put them in pairs, you get one plus a hundred, which is 101. You get two plus 99, which is also uh, 101. 101. And then you take three and 96, sorry, three and 98, that adds up to be 101. And you keep on doing this, four and 97, five and 96. Um, each of these and every time gives us a 101, 101, 101. It's like we're counting Dalmatians right now. Uh, in the end, you end up with 100 plus one, which also adds up to be 101. And so Gauss always knows we got this pattern. The pair, the pairs always add up to be 101. And so then he makes the observation, well, how many 101s do we have? Uh, well, we're going to have 100 different pairs because we have one for one, two, three, four, up to 100. There's going to be 100 different pairs, which each add up to be 101 themselves. So we can take 100 times 101. Um, I'm sorry, we can get, we can get 100 times 101. That gives the total sum here. But you'll notice that we took the sum we were looking for and we counted it twice. We got it forward and backwards. So that's actually double the amount we want. So we'll divide this by two. 
And so then, you, you know, 2 goes into 150 times, you get 50 times 101, uh, which is equal to 5,050, which is, of course, the correct sum of the numbers from 1 to 100. And as the legend goes, little Gauss there was the only one who was able to get it correctly. And that's because instead of taking the obvious approach, he took somewhat of the less uh, obvious approach, a mathematical approach to this problem. And so let me kind of talk about how this works in general. If you take, if you take the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 and you go up to n, let's write this thing backwards. We're going to call this thing s for sum. If you write it backwards, you get n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 all the way down to 1. And the same thing is going to happen. When you put these things in pairs, you're going to get n plus 1, n plus 1, n plus 1, n plus 1. Uh, so you end up, so you twice the sum is going to equal n plus 1, you get it once, plus n plus 1, you get it twice. And then this keeps on happening over and over and over, and you just keep on getting n plus 1 each and every time. And if you sit down and count them, you're going to get n times n plus 1. Well, if you solve for s and divide by 2, you're going to get that the sum equals n times n plus 1 over 2, uh, which is the same basic idea that a uh, little 10-year-old Gauss had in this formula, or to get this formula. I'm going to erase that here. Uh, so you see, you see this formula right here, n times n plus 1 over 2. Now, this, this next one, if we want to add up together sigma of i squared, this one's a little bit more involved. Um, and and I, I do want to kind of talk about the details behind it because it presents a really interesting technique uh, on how how one could compute this thing. And so what we're going to do is, is we're going to count this sum, the sum of i squared, in two different ways. And if we count them in two different ways and get two different formulas, then those two formulas have to equal each other. And we can work from there. And so we're not actually going to use sigma of i squared. We're actually going to look at something a little bit different. We're going to look at sigma of... I plus one plus I cubed minus I cubed as I ranges from one to N. Now this might look like an interesting place to be, but what I want to do is show you um, what we get here. So we're going to do two different attempts. So if we look at this the first time, let's just expand it out, right? If you expand it out, you're going to end up with two cubed minus one cubed plus you're going to get three cubed minus two cubed. The next term, you look, you'll get 4 cubed minus 3 cubed. And this pattern will continue on, continue on, until you end up with a the very last term. You're going to get n plus 1 cubed minus n cubed, like so. So what's going on here? So each of the terms in this sum have two pieces to them. So this is our first term. This is our second term. This is our third term. And this will continue on until our nth term right here. And so th that's how these things are going to break up. But then the observation that we make next is if you compare terms side by side, this one has a 2 cubed in it. This one has a negative 2 cubed in it as well. If we were to combine those together, they're going to cancel out. 2 cubed minus 2 cubed. And if you look at the next group, right, one of them, the first one has a 3 cubed. The next one has a negative 3 cubed. If we put those together, those are going to cancel out as well. And if we keep on doing this side by side by side, the next term, which I didn't mention, it would have a 4 cubed in it. It would cancel out. Uh, the next two are going to have a 5 cubed that cancel out. The next ones are going to have a 6 cubed that cancel out. And this is going to continue all the way down to the very end, where everyone cancels out except for two pieces. Uh, you'll see that the final n plus 1 cubed had no one to cancel out with because there's no next term in the sum. And then also the very first term, the one cubed, had no one to cancel out with, with as well. And so if we if we write this thing out, this sum will add up to be n plus 1 cubed minus 1. And if we were to uh, multiply that thing out, the n plus 1 cubed, uh, if we multiply that thing out, uh, you end up with an n cubed plus 3n squared. I'm going to kind of skip all the details here. 3n plus 1, and then a minus 1. And so the plus 1s cancel out. And this thing adds up to be n cubed plus 3n squared plus 3n.
like so. And so that gives us one of the calculations. Like I said, we're going to do it two times. So this is sort of like our first attempt at computing it. Uh, let's try to compute it in a, in a different way here. If we were to try to do it again, well, what if we try to, instead of expanding the sum first and then simplifying it, what if we try to simplify this expression first and then expand it, right? If we try that approach, um, you can multiply out the one plus i cubed and you'll end up with something like the following. Uh, you end up with i cubed plus three i squared plus three i plus one. And that's the first bit when you FOIL it out. And then you have a minus i cubed right here. And so since there's some i cubes that uh, get each other, you can cancel those things out like so and so. And then the next piece, you're gonna end up with the sum of three i squared plus three i plus one. Again, as i goes from one to n. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the linearity properties that we had seen in the previous slide and try to expand this thing. Um, if you do that, uh, you're gonna end up with the following. You get three times the sum of i squared plus three times the sum of i plus the sum of one. And in all of these cases, you get i going from one to n. i goes from one to n. i goes from one to n. All right. Now for the first one, hmm, we don't really know what it is. That's actually what we're trying to solve right now. So we're gonna call this s for short. Uh, but as for the other two, the sum of i's, we talked about that a moment ago. Gauss had a formula for such a thing. This looks like n times n plus one over two. And for the last one, this was a much easier one. This was just equal to n. And so if we apply those formulas, we end up with the following, three times s plus three n times n plus one over two plus just an n right there. And so this gives us a different representation of the same thing. So let's connect this to the formula we had above. These two things count the same thing. They have to equal each other. So we end up with n cubed plus three n squared plus three n. And so what we're then gonna do is we're going to solve for the s that's over here, right? And so we're gonna do that by subtracting n from both sides. Uh, we're gonna subtract this three n times n plus one over two. Um, I don't actually care for the fraction a little bit, uh, but we'll deal with that in just a second. Deal with that. Uh, so we end up with 3s on the left-hand side. The right-hand side, we're going to get an n cubed plus a 3n squared. 3n minus n gives us a 2n. And then we have this minus 3n, 3 over 2, n times n plus 1. Uh, so to make this thing a little bit easier to use, uh, what I'm going to do is I want to times both sides of the equation by 2 uh, to, to get rid of the fraction. So that gives us a 6s is equal to two n cubed plus six n squared plus four n minus three n times n plus one. Uh, let's distribute this three n right here. Uh, that's gonna give us a minus three n squared minus three n. Let's combine those with the other terms we have. So six s is equal to two n cubed. Uh, six n minus three n gives us three n squared. Uh, and then 4n minus 3n gives us just an n, like so. Um, looking at the right-hand side, I can't help but notice it factors. There's a common factor of n. So you take out the n, that leaves behind 2n squared plus 3n plus 1. Um, it also factors a little bit more, 2n squared plus 3n plus 1. Uh, we could factor that as n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. And so to finish, we have to divide everything by 6. And we get that the sum is equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. And so that's a really drawn out argument. It's quite involved right there. And if we come back up, that was the formula we had before. The sum of squares, uh, the sum of, of squares, the sum of i cubed equals n times n plus 1 times n 2n plus 1 over 6. All right, quite involved. Uh, and there's some interesting things in there. I wanted to kind of show you the details so that you can kind of appreciate how one tries to work with these sums here. 
Also, this blue argument right here um, actually provides a very interesting technique that we'll see in use in the future. It's the idea of what's called a telescoping sum. Uh, and the idea is, for a telescoping sum, imagine you have an ancient spyglass that a pirate would use as he sails the seven seas, right? Well, when he's looking upon the horizon, the chambers of the telescope are extended all the way out so that he can see in the distance. Um, but then when he's done with his spyglass, he collapses it back down so that all the chambers overlay and you see basically one component. So that's what happened here in this first attempt of counting things. In its expanded form, it was really, really, really long. But then as you start squishing it together, lots of terms cancel out, cancel out, cancel out. And so you're left with just two pieces, one lens here and the eyepiece right there. So one could compute the sum of I squared using this technique of telescoping sums. Um, one can replicate this argument uh, for the sum of I cubed. Um, if you do that, you end up with the sum of I cubed will equal N times N plus one over two quantity squared. So notice this, this formula here looks like the sum of I, except everything got squared right there. Um, the detail is quite quite long, much like we just saw a moment ago, and it, it's similar, the, the argument's very similar, right? I'm not gonna provide the details here, but you're welcome to work it out on your own if you wanted to. And you could also do the sum of I to the fourth, I to the fifth, I to the sixth. They get a little bit more complicated, complicated, complicated the more you do. Uh, but I just want to show you that one can compute these things. And so in our next video, we're actually going to show you how you can uh, simplify some examples involving sigmas and i's using these formulas. Uh, look to the links in the video to see that, that next video coming up just right now.